Well, welcome everybody. Um, it's been a long trek to get to this event. Uh, we had to cancel before because um, Anthony Van Coovering. Oh, and Eric, maybe you could just uh, mute your microphone for now. Um, are you anything back? It's just that we're hearing a lot of banging and crashing from your end. Ah, uh, like this. Yeah, so just switch it on when you need to speak. Um, you know, originally we were going to have this in April. It came from a, a conversation between uh, Eric and I during uh, the ICANN Nairobi event, and, uh, and Anthony, you know, that he suggested that, uh, that there should be more of a public process, you know, within in, in the uh, yeah the whole process of acquiring a .NYC top-level domain. Um, he said he would be happy to come here and speak about uh, cause proposal and. Uh, and I was in a chat room at the time of Vancouver, and he said I would, he would be keen to do it as well, so we went to set it up. When it came to the day, uh, Anthony had a domestic problem and couldn't make it, and so we rescheduled. Uh, now we've rescheduled, and uh, Anthony again, for other reasons, can't make it, but we're going to show video of him. Um, and then we've had uh, further problems today in that uh, there's been a lot of wind up in Ithaca, where Eric lives, and all his flight was cancelled. So what we have is him on the, the video screen, and uh, it's quite via Skype, so he can he can communicate. But I'm, you know, I'm glad that Eric's here because, you know, his his whole process is a community-based top-level domain is what they and he has experience of actually practical experience bringing them together. And uh, we've got people here that have got you know ideas of that. We've got uh, Council Member Brewer here who has um, always su supported this idea. Um, so uh, the background, which you've, if you're watching, you've already read on the web page, is that uh, last October, the uh, New York City Department of Information, Technology, and Telecommunications put out an RFP, um, and a bunch of people put in proposals. And they asked for two different uh, proposals. And one was for a, a commercial type proposal and one was for a, a non-commercial type proposal. They also mentioned uh, that, they, that a whole bunch of names would be reserved, you know, which included, uh, you know, things for the, the police and other things and also some areas. Um, uh, in 2008, uh, Councilmember Brewer did hold a public hearing where there were uh, presentations from, uh, from Tom who's here today, and from, and from uh, Vancouver, and we're going to show some video for, from that later, including um, some questions from uh, Bill de Blasio, who's now our public advocate. And um, so, uh, without much further ado, I'd like to bring up uh, Councilmember Brewer to say what, how she's feeling about it now. And I will say that in that hearing, she said that she thought, did recommend that the only way she thought of doing it was a was a non-profit. I'm interested to hear if she still feels the same way. Jolie, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, Jolie, because Jolie is the only reason that the technology community did so well, and it was over and over again. He was a huge and huge, huge supporter of making the information public, and I want to thank you because to this day, I believe the only of the 40 city council committees that exist, the only ones that have been put up on YouTube or as accessible as this one is thanks to Jolie and our staff, Kunal and um, Sam, but particularly to Jolie. So just a plug for his efforts. Um, this issue of um, the status of the RFP and who's responded and I can is something that you probably know more about the, than I do. I will tell you that there's a new commissioner at Dewitt. Um, as you know, uh, Commissioner Cosgrave has gone back to Florida to work there and Cal Post is a new commissioner. And um, I think her interest, to be honest with you, is very open in terms of the public. That's what, the reason I'm involved in technology is because I believe that government information should be public. And I'll talk a minute about ICANN and this process, but I'm a big believer in using technology as you do, not for technology's sake, but in my world to make public information public that should already be public. And that's really why for the last 20 years I've been trying to learn as much as I can and to use technology to do that. You have much more expertise in the actual uh, uh, programming and way things work, but I understand what I want to use it for. And to that end, just FYI, when we met with her recently, 
a bill that Jolie's aware of and Lewis is aware of and others and Tom that would make city databases public is something that she's very interested in. So that particular piece of legislation is moving. And of course, it won't be every single database. There are personnel and personal health uh, records and so on that will not be first responder and so on. But that's the good news because that would help in general some of the worlds that you are operating in um, be able to be uh, used. We want the information to be in a format that is something that people can use, not uh, PDF, but something that people can use. So working on that, hearings to be uh, done in 2010. In terms of the uh, issue of ICANN and dot NYC, it is thanks to Tom that this issue even came up. Um, he's been working on it for a very long time, and I think until he brought it up and we had a hearing, nobody at City Hall was ever even thinking about doing it. And then uh, Speaker Quinn uh, was looking for some issues to put into her speech regarding small business and promotion of New York, and she included that in, what, two years ago, I think, in her the state of the city, and that uh, as much as we stand on our head and we talk about it, when it goes into the speaker's speech, you have a lot more visibility on the issue. And I know, as Joel indicated, that the RFP went out and was responded to at the end of last year, and I think it's a little, you probably, I haven't, I must admit I didn't check with you this week, but a couple weeks ago, nothing had happened since that RFP went out. I, I have met with, just so I'm clear, with two for-profit, and you'll know the names better than I because I can't remember them, but two for-profit companies who were interested, and I, one um, has a lot of other, I think, uh, domains, and the other one was a group that didn't seem to have much uh, work in this area of uh, thinking of creatively. So I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I can't even remember the names of them, but you probably know exactly who they are. They both had hired lobbyists, and they were both pushing because when companies come to New York, they were not New York City based. The first thing they do is hire lobbyists. Whether we like it or not, that's exactly what happens. Um, so the issue now, as I understand it from Do It, is the schedule of ICANN. Putting together this proposal is challenging. Um, de Blasio's question, then Council Member de Blasio, focused on what does New York City get out of this, not necessarily the public, or what does the city of New York get out of this? Because a private company is not going to apply unless there's money to be made. Uh, it's a different for a nonprofit. But these two companies, as I understand it, whomever these two companies offered to, you know, what they would do, and I would assume that's what any private company would think of, is that what upset me a little bit. Well, let me just talk about the Blasio. The Blasio was concerned, not knowing as much as you do, that if this middleman, so to speak, was hired and the domains were revenue producing, the money would go to uh, the companies and New York City itself would get very little. And that was a concern. That's what he brought up at the hearing. The, you know, I'll be playing video of his comments. Yeah, so you'll, you'll hear that. Yeah. The second issue that I was concerned about, and this is just me speaking, the advantage of a nonprofit is that, as Tom has said over and over again, the pizza, the deli, the blah, 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 from you know Queens Village or the West Side, is the uh, highlight that we want. We want to talk about the great pizza that somebody has or the great you know, uh, cleaning, green cleaning that somebody has. Because, the, and the, you know, the sofa that's made in New York City with the dot NYC. The companies, the private companies, obviously are in this for the revenue and they want to put down, you know, uh, Gail or Tom or Jolie or Lewis, or anybody can get uh, something that says dot NYC. And although that may be revenue producing, I can move to Australia tomorrow, or I can move whatever, and that doesn't mean that I'm a New Yorker anymore. And I'm very, very biased about the five boroughs. Um, you know, I don't even go anywhere else. I'm very biased about the five boroughs. <laughs> so I'm horribly provincial. So, but I think that's the purpose of this, is yes to, you know, somebody, the city of New York needs to make something out of this, because it's gonna cost them to uh, do the work and the administrative, but also the person at the other end has to be authentic. Whoever's doing it has to be talking about our city. We need to be able to highlight the businesses and the nonprofits that make this city uh, so great. So that's, you know, the answer is should it be a nonprofit or should it be commercial? The question would be 
could there be some public-private partnership? Putting this together is a challenge. I mean, putting together this big proposal, you know better than I. And um, I, Gail Brewer, cannot tell do it. I can make suggestions, but in the end, it's up to the mayor's office and do it to issue and to select. And the question would be, uh, what kind of public input? That was the other thing that came out of the hearing, is that whatever the RFP says, we would like to have some, we, the public, when I say we, I mean the city council, but that's usually, that means the public hearings on whatever is submitted to ICANN because that would, um, that's a public process at ICANN and it's a public process we would like to say before it goes to ICANN. So since I haven't, you, I've seen the RFP because it's online, but I haven't seen the responses you may have. Nobody so, has. Yeah, so nobody has. So I know, I don't know exactly what was suggested, I can tell you the criteria that we were interested in the city council is to re recap is what is the city of New York, because we are no surprise to you, desperate for revenue. At the same time, what public input goes into an ICANN proposal, and certainly, certainly, we would like to have at the very least a public-private partnership, not just public, not just uh, private. And I think that's what I would, I would say. Now, since there's a new commissioner, and there is a new way of thinking about technology uh, in her mind. I think this would be the time, perhaps, Dan Grodnick is now chair of the committee. He's a council member. I am on the committee and still very active. He's a good friend. We actually co-chair the Manhattan delegation together. We work extremely well together. I'm doing governmental operations. There's a lot of overlap in terms of my committee and uh, technology. We work, like I said, very well together. So I think this would be the time to work on what is going on with the proposal? What is the city considering? What happened to the RFP responses? And you know, obviously having this meeting today uh, pushes that agenda. So that's where I'm at. I, I don't know a lot more to be able to add, but I'm sure listening, we will, we will learn more. All right, I don't know if there are any questions. Joel, yeah. go ahead. You know a lot um, more than well, I Well, I mean, what it is is that, you know, the, the, the things are confidential proposals. Yes. Right. And the companies don't want that information is proprietary information, there's things that can affect them, you know, their stock price and all this kind of thing. Right. And they're complicated. But uh, what I would think is, is that there are questions that are that, that do it as now could formulate a bunch of questions which are options that have come up that are, okay, we could either do it this way, mm -hmm. we could do it this way, mm -hmm. and they could then put that right. to the public before they go, you know, I mean, what we don't want to see is then to just say, okay, we picked this guy and nobody has any say. And the other advantage to doing a public process with a sign-off and a resolution from the city council is it makes it a stronger application than yeah. ICANN. I, I mean, mean, I think the, that, that the, makes a huge difference. Well, no, the thing is that ICANN has now said if you're going to make a geographic-based domain, you must have approval of the community, Correct. which in this case, so basically you, there has, there's going to have Correct. to be a resolution from the, from, Correct. Council. from the council. Right. I mean, but obviously, you know, the mayor is the administrator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Got to, he's got to present that to the council. No, I, I mean, absolutely. And I think that would be the time to figure out what the city gets out of it and what the public gets out of it. And but I think before then, there should be process. Yeah. I think there should be process. And then, you know, what I would think would be a good step would be if, if you know, do it said, okay, we've got a bunch of proposals. They're all very interesting. We can't give details, but there are these issues. Yeah. There are now these issues. Have a public hearing on those issues. Yep. Um, it may be the Rotmix committee, mm -hmm. and um, and then from that make a secondary bunch of requests for proposals. From all right, we now say this, and then all the people who are because right, you'd have some criteria. Sort of second round of, of, of things, and then before before we go ahead, I, I would agree, and then you'd have a second round of criteria. Yeah, having based on the public input the first time. The big issue that ICANN hasn't settled on is this thing of the vertical integration, where the registrars must be separate from the registries. Correct. And this is, you know, nobody really knows where they're going with this. It means that, you know, so if you set up as a registry, right, that NYC you're not allowed to actually sell the debates. Right, and that's what the companies would like because they make money. Well, you know, it's... I'm not saying it's right, I'm I saying... Think, I, you know, I don't know if Tom or, or, or Eric is going to address this. It's okay. a complicated subject that's still under discussion. And I, my guess is that the city of New York, because when we talked with the NYC, which was a year and a half ago, NYC and company, they hadn't figured it out either. In other words, this is a very new topic. Yeah. Tom has up there smoking and trans fat and everything else, which are, you know, probably better understood. No smoking, period. Um, 
the things that have changed New York dramatically, and they all passed, and they're all great. Um, this is more complicated because uh, there it, it's not as clear to the probably to the agencies. The city will do anything to make money. I'm just telling you that right now with this budget <laughs> crisis. That is a fact. So the, you know within limits, but there is a big interest in revenue. So the question is, in my mind, how do you make sure we don't lose revenue in it, and how at the same time make sure the interest of the public um, is forefront? And how you do that, we need to learn and figure it out. You know, the, the questions come as one is, you know, as, as top level domains multiply, is it going to be such a, such a, a big money making thing? It's one question. Right, we don't want to lose these are, You know, if you look at the thing, .org and .com and like, you know, whatever, like this and everything else, everybody else is just, you know. Pennies. Pen, ticking, ticking along. Right. And that, um, and that uh, we're going to hear an, an interesting uh, presentation from Wikimedia, you know, later on, later on in this session about, you know, one a, a very practical idea, and that if if the thing was 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 done at a much more, you know, purposely made as a community, you know, something that was only done for the in the public interest and mm -hmm. not no just to dispense with the commercial, okay. might it actually have more value okay. by being that? You know, right. that's something that one of the reasons we're having this thing today to like see if that. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing to listen, and I think the public. You know, I know that you have to go early. No, I, I can leave a few minutes. I'll, you know, I'll be but, here for uh, You know, he's not scheduled to the second session. Okay. But uh, but we'll make sure to videotape it so you'll have a chance. Thank you, Joel. Ask yes, a question. The uh, I can in their latest guidebook, which is they have one or two more that they're going to have to come out. But the latest one said that they had to, that an applicant for a city TLD had to have approval or a letter of support from the local governing authority. Mm -hmm. So you're presuming, I'd always presume that the council is my local governing authority and the, and the mayor. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I'd have to, I mean, maybe somebody at Do It has researched it. I hope that the city government would have enough, because this is something that will be extremely controversial if it's not done with some public input. Right? In other words, I think politically, I don't know if legally that would count as the city council and the administration what you just stated, mm -hmm. but I would think politically from our, from the doer's perspective, because this is not something that, um, like, you know, will impact just the administration. This will have a huge impact on business, not just us here in the room, but on business and nonprofits and everybody in New York. So I would assume that they would want to have some public hearings on it, politically. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be crazy to just have a, something go to ICANN without public input. That would be my... I mean, I think they would see it that way. And, and do you think initially at this point that you would think that the technology committee is the more uh, appropriate one? Probably t I'm just guessing. Um, we certainly have technology, small business. I Could just don't so. know. There's a joint lot of hearings. Of, there's a lot of. Right. There are many joint hearings now. I think trying to get more participation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but I'll certainly be at all of them. I, I would say that at least two committees would would look at this. And I, I would say, I mean, I'm going to write a letter after participating today to the to do it, asking for updates, which I will send you all copies of, and asking for um, public hearings on whatever uh, opportunities exist on this topic. In other words, don't forget that this is a public issue that you need to have input. The new commissioner, Carol Post, I was very fond of Paul Cosgrave too, but she's, she comes from uh, operations which is the mayor's office that deals with how the city agencies operate. And she's very open. Um, she kind of understands that there's a meaning and it's very important to get public input. So it's a little bit different approach. She's very close to the administration, so she's not afraid of bucking them if necessary. She's all, always whispering things in my ear. Don't put this on you. What about Bill de Blasio? Like he's not so involved. Well, he's, very, well, he's involved, but um, he's not a member of the city council. I mean, he can't vote. He does, you know, he can do. I mean, when press we tried to get, get hold of him for this, it seemed like he was too busy. That's not my problem, Dolly. That's I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> Man, I, 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 is there any chance? Of, have you seen any interest on the part of uh, Kopik coming back to life again? Kopik is the question. I have been bugging him about it. The commission of, I think Tom and I and Gene Washinoff and maybe Jolie and are the only people in New York City who know what Kopik is. COPIC is the Commission on Public Information and Communication, and it was a, a byproduct 
of the 1989-1990 charter revision. As you know, there's a new charter revision now. Right. But I do think it, A, it needs to be updated because the word internet is not in its bylaws because it was actually developed in 89-90, and so internet is not in it. Betsy Gottbaum only had one hearing after I drove her crazy for four years. <laughs> Um, so uh, I've been driving Bill de Blasio crazy also about convening it. So the COPIC is supposed to, in its most general form, um, discuss and have hearings and vote on procedures that do what I like, which is to make government information public. That's the, that's the genesis of COPIC. So you can look at a more de defined definition online. Um, but, you know, he's got to call it. Now it does, it is, the board, which does exist, because I got it finally passed by the council, and you know it exists. A board itself is controlled by the mayor, um, Anthony Crowell, who is council to the mayor, is the chair of the board of Copic, and so it still has, um, even though it's under the public advocates' auspices, it is a board controlled by the mayor's people. So, just so you know, in terms of thinking that De Blasio will be able to control it, that is not correct. Uh, so there's a commission on public with with there are people on members. It. Yes. And there's a board. Where is the yeah board? the board the members? When I say board, I mean the members. Uh, and the Copic members are what I consider a board. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's got um, you know commissioners. You know the list. It's got commissioners, a couple of public members, and I'm the rep from the city council. Yeah. Okay. So it's, I think there's like I don't remember like four or five of us, not a majority, who are not from the mayor's office, so to speak. Okay. Or not. Uh, appointed by the mayor. Well, but COVID think, could, could deal with some of these issues mm -hmm. of uh, what the public's input should be on the issues of communication, and certainly to me, this is one of them. Yes. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, if you look at the membership of COPIC, I, I saw it that there were four members appointed by the mayor right. who he could probably count on, and that if a public advocate was pervasive, was persuasive, that, there, that he could conceivably control it by, uh, you know, convincing those other seven members that whatever the policy would well, be. Well, I remember that the mayors, there are certain statutory members like head of do it and I can't remember, and then there are certain people appointed by the mayor, if I remember correctly. Doris is on it, which is the municipal library, do it, uh, et cetera. But I'm, I'm pretty sure, I'm positive, if you look at the numbers, they're either appointed by the mayor or they are statutory offices that are held by commissioners. Yeah. Uh, you, you're probably right. I was just. I mean, there's no question that, you know, you can have a discussion and they're open, but uh -huh. in the end, I'm just end, making it clear. Guy who appoints you has yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So is, is, is that commission basically dormant? <laughs> right now it is. I'm bugging. It's also not, it wouldn't hurt for you. Does, I don't know if it would be a direct line to helping us, helping us with um, a domain or. I can. I just don't know. But it, you know, it's something. Every we should do it for other reasons. Like I mean, it, it seems like we could, there is some kind of process where if we came up with a proposal, we could yeah. go around to the community boards and get the community boards all to say, yeah, we like this idea, yes. and then come back yes. through with that. I think that would be fine. The we community boards are would be, I think, very interested in a community uh, dot NYC because they want to, you know, highlight the businesses in the neighborhoods, absolutely. So yes, the community boards would be a good explanation, so it takes some explaining, Right. to be honest with you. You know, because yeah. Tom was on his community board, I was on, I don't know if anybody else on. Tom and I have been on community boards forever. Yeah, how are the community boards uh, on the subject matter going to fare in the uh, charter? <coughs> well, let me tell you some amazing news. The community boards were cut uh, in the preliminary budget. The mayor puts out a budget in January, and then he puts out a budget in May. So May 6th, he put out his budget. They got, not only did they get restored, but they got restored to 2010. And they got baseline, which they never gotten before. So they are not going to be cut again, which was, nobody figured it out. I started, <laughs> the community boards figured it out real quick. And then I called Office of Management Budget because I was in shock. So the community boards got baseline, they got everything they wanted in terms of funding. Now, of course, they could always use more. And the charter, <clears throat> I guess funding sort of gave me an indication that they're not gonna be touched. Uh -huh. Would I like to see them have more? That's a different story. 
I personally would like to see some planning on every community board. That's a different discussion, I think, that you and I could have. But in terms of funding, they're in ecstasy. Well, thank you. <clears throat> I've got another just totally off topic Go question, ahead. which is that, um, when, when is the report going to come out on, on the, the broadband? broadband. Yeah. I wish I could say that. It, I would say, Jolie, we've been working really, really hard, and you will, before. I would say in the next two weeks, we're really trying. It, it's been a long struggle because of small staff, and um, I would hope in the next two weeks. And you'll get a copy before it goes out. So we'll I mean, I, I've reviewed a copy, yeah. but uh, you know, I wonder, it seems pretty finished to me. We're, so we're getting, it, it it. Just, we, no, I think it's just a question of, I'm very neurotic about grammar and everything in English yeah. and, okay. and you know, people's input and making sure the members go for it. So. You've seen, I mean, we're working hard to be sure it's well written. And we, you know, we change fonts and we do all those horrible things. Yeah. Okay. What we're getting, I mean, obviously there's a lot going on at the FCC, that's for sure. So the timing is probably quite good. Yes. There's quite a bit going on. A few law, a few court cases here and there. No, I mean, this this third wave introduced this week is uh, unbelievable. Uh, yes. We'll see what happens with that. Okay. I'll be here and listen to. Them. Whatever. Anyway, I will move on our end to try to find out what's go going on with Do It and to try to get some public sessions on this topic okay. as a result of your efforts. Thank you. Right, great. Thank you. Thank you. Just making sure I'm down. Thanks, Gail. Thank we'd, you. We'd like to thank you just for all, you know, well, thank you, years, of, years of effort on this. Thank you very much. Um, and so uh, now we've got Eric, and uh, let me just do an introduction here. Oh. <laughs> He's just rebooting the, the, the uh, projection screen, Eric, so we can't see you at this very minute. Oh, yes, we can. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, I've... Are we echoing? Eric, Eric um, is Chief Technical Officer for CORE, which is an international not-for-profit membership association of internet domain name registrars. As such, he's responsible for the technical correctness of CORE's new TLD applications. Previous TLD applications he's contributed technical content to on behalf of several clients. Uh, .cat, which is the Catalans in, uh, in Spain, uh, .org, um, which uh, is now run by the Internet Society, as we know, and um, .biz, .us, .coop, and .museum. Eric was one of the principal contributors to the IETF's ProvRep Working Group, which wrote the EPP RFC series, whatever that is, so he may tell us. And uh, <coughs> he uh, leads a GTLD project for Native American Indigenous peoples and is an active member in the extended California and Oklahoma Cherokee and Maine Abenaki communities. And, um, and it's very interesting, and I was not until, you know, I kind of started, he told me about this, that I really realized that CORE's application was very, was very much a sort of a community, you know, was a community-based application and that it's the kind of, it fits in with the kind of thing that Tom has been, you know, asking for for years. So we're very interested to hear from him about that. And uh, I guess it's over to you. Can we hear you? Okay. As soon as I turn up the microphone, can you hear Yeah. 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 Let's see if I can crank you up from here. I'll turn it up a little bit more. Yeah, that's good. Good. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry that I can't be here today. Um, airplanes and weather don't cooperate. Um, I'm located in Ithaca, where my wife is going to law school at Cornell. And um, the rest of Porter, of course, is located in Europe, Ireland, Germany, Switzerland. Um, Catalonia, which uh, is part of Spain itself, uh, and uh, uh, Norway. <coughs> we also have other locations. Uh, the filming view here is my children upstairs. So I, I put notes as um, as I was listening to Gail, um, and I wish I was here to meet you in person, Gail. Um, and so let me just run down this before starting on the uh, uh, is Gail still present? Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep. Good. So, CORE is a nonprofit. That's, I think, the first issue that uh, uh, is important. So the second is, of course, we haven't hired a lobbyist. Uh, and this Good. course has, the lobbyist this CORE has, uh, at least on this side of the farm. 
Um, I can schedule that slip so significant, like really you're looking at nothing before the fourth quarter of this year in terms of the earliest date that applications can be accepted. So it's entirely reasonable for you to throw your hands up and say, let's start all over again in terms of letting out of RFP. Sam, yeah. on the phone. Um, the concern about the revenue not going to the city, um, we understand our, our concern actually is that we're concerned with the possibility of cities looting um, uh, registry operations, which would prevent the expansion of use of the registry. And, and a sort of, we're concerned basically that cities might inadvertently kill their own registries by taking out the profit rather than reinvesting the profit in, in the, uh, making the space a more useful tool for citizens. Part of the problem here, of course, is that no one's yet done this. We've, uh, we did count, which is a, uh, a quasi country, really. It's not really a GTLD so much as a CCTLD in disguise. And cities will be very similar things in that they will mostly have um, a large public government um, component. There will be some city proposals which don't have uh, public involvement, but so far, um, ours, as Barcelona, our first one, Paris, our second, uh, have public involvement, significant public involvement. Um, but to get to the revenue figure, we plan to, I mean, our offer was 34% of the gross to the city, and then the rest would be provided both for course development and also for the, the uh, .NYC as an enterprise at, in its development. Um, you asked about the public, or you commented significantly about the public input to ICANN in the proposal period. Um, Writing an application doesn't really require that, although I understand why it's, it can be necessary for local reasons. But the real issue is getting to the contract negotiation phase with ICANN staff, which happens rather late in the application process. So just getting a good application into their hands um, really is sufficient for most of the purposes until it comes to the actual negotiation of a contract. And this is where we take a deep breath and walk up the edge of a cliff because I can tell you, so, grappling with the problem of contract management, where the contracts are numbered in the hundreds, um, and they're concerned sufficiently that they're trying to get us to agree to having only one contract, one universal contract, which would cover all kinds of operations, those which are good, those which are bad, and those which are well, um, beautiful. <clears throat> so that, that's an unexplored area of the ICANN process. Um, what else? Um, there was discussion of vertical integration. That is, again, another um, uh, unsolved area. That, uh, I'm in this working group, it is extremely busy as policy development area. Um, the basic model was registries were capped, or registrars were capped their interest. Registries were capped at 15% approximately, and are interested in registrars. The, this historically comes from the division of network solutions for our Verisun. Um, and there's a, considerable, there's a lot of gaming possibility in having registrars be owned by registries, um, uh, mostly involving the extraction of value from the first 100,000 or so names which are called premium names by some in the domain or, domain or industry, um, where the value is, well, considerably high. Um, but that's for registries which really don't serve the public interest in the real sense. Um, I think that covers all the notes that I took during the previous discussion. Um, I would like to say that we don't think that New York is going to lose money on this, uh, uh, far from it. Uh, but we would like to be conservative about what we think the growth prospects are uh, and not make uh, outrageous promises. So for that, I'll turn to um, uh, us and our, our proposal writing process. Um, we found out about this, of course, in April of last year, so it's just been almost 13 months now, um, when the city released a RFI. Um, 
we attempted to respond to the RFI, but we're unable to come to an agreement about whether we should write over the city's head in a sense that it's quite a very um, sophisticated proposal for collecting our, our knowledge came from, from uh, Barcelona and Paris, or whether we should write uh, sort of beneath the knees a uh, uh, very simple minded uh, proposal, our response to the RFI. So, but that disagreement for inability to reach the decide which was the better course of action, uh, we let the RFI period expire without submitting a response. <clears throat> the RFP was issued of course in October and then rescheduled several times, um, which was uh, awkward, I think, for all of the, all the respondents. Uh, I mean, the schedule repeated the slip. Um, what we submitted, and I'm, I have a browser crash uh, uh, about the time the Gale started speaking. And it hasn't come back. I think it's a live stream uh, artifact. Um, so I'm essentially doing this blind um, and the misdemeanor computer. Yeah, Steve um, Jobs is right. Flash does crash the crash show. Oh, God, uh, yes. Flash is a horrible application. It crashes everything I've ever owned. <laughs> Um, we submitted um, our proposal was in several parts, a technical part, a, um, a financial part, and a public policy part, in addition to which we sent we know um, actually crashed my browser again to get rid of the wreckage. Um, what you have in front of you is a portion of the technical proposal. The original technical proposal that we submitted to DOITT is 126 pages long in three parts. Uh, what I've done is I've removed the part that is extremely boring which is the uh, EPD schema definition, which uh, Joel was kind enough to blend for um, as being involved in the creation of the EPD, which is the extensible provisioning protocol. It's basically XML syntax, so we use XML, which we believed at the time would be extensible, but it actually isn't, um, to package up a bunch of work and ship it over the wire, and that work is registration data. Um, so I got rid of that and got rid of the parts that indicate the physical and technical structure of course registry which would be of use to an attacker. Um, I think that's reasonable. Can I just um, can I just interrupt you, Eric, to say that please. this report I've given the one copy that I printed out to Gail so she's got something to take away and that you sure. did offer that you did offer that you would mail it to anybody if you want to hand in your address, we'll yes. we'll get the copies mailed to you afterwards. Okay. Yeah, for Gail, I gave her the, uh, you know, the, the stuff we sent to the OIT, I don't see any reason not to. Uh, presumably, she's not a script kitty, um, and you know, a responsible person, and uh, not a So you're saying he'll give you a copy of his full application if you want to? Yes. <clears throat> um, so, what was there was 126 pages, what you have now is about 55 pages, and uh, then in addition, there was a financial and policy proposal which ran through uh, 33 pages with five, with five parts. Now, the city required every respondent um, to provide two responses, one for a community-based application and one for a standard application. When the city originally wrote the terms, of course, though the, uh, the term standard was not yet used by it, and that came in with that version of the draft applicant's guide with the DAG. Uh, for short sure, yeah, those of us in the very public stack three or deck two, and we're waiting for deck four, which will come out shortly before the Brussels meeting in late June. Uh, these are the rules of the road, uh, which we are the co authors of, as well as the, uh, the victims of. So, we were required to provide two applications or two basic business plans, as well as two basic policy statements of how we go about both the standard and a community based application. Um, we strongly recommend a community-based application for a variety of reasons. Um, one of the more surprising reasons is the lack of financial difference between the two. Um, it's a presumption of everyone in the industry that uh, commercial open TLDs are going to make a lot more money than 
Um, any of you so far sponsored TLDs, such as Harold, who's making a co op, um, and Kenneth. Um, the surprising thing is when you look at something like the city of New York with 8 million inhabitants, um, there is a surprisingly large number of um, parties who have intellectual property interests and names who are in New York already. And so the the uh, difference between opening up NYC to any registrant, uh, so presumably an intellectual property holder in Saudi Arabia, um, is not very much greater. In fact, it might even be less than the city of New York um, or the NYC to be defined as businesses with an interest in a physical presence in her, and therefore the uh, limited trademark interests of those in particular uh, as being able to register their domains. When we look at um, the business licensing issue for sort of outside of the standard or trademark and the, uh, the, and the notion of the kinds of names which are reserved for sunrise period and for land rush period, uh, two periods that happen before domains are made available to the general public. When we look at business licenses, there's a, a large volume of that as well in the city of New York. So in fact, it may be that the community-based proposal may have more intellectual property interest in it than an open or standard proposal for NYC that anyone in the world being able to register for whatever reason, uh, a string in by NYC. <clears throat> so I wanted to speak uh, to that particular issue of the difference between the two models and also point out that you were required to respond uh, with both a standard application and a community-based application. Um, questions? None right now. That was none for right now? Right. Okay. Um, <coughs> if you respond better to questions, then you're listening to myself monologue in front of the dead screen. Um, we're, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let me let me um, let me speak to the basic principles. Um, we first we being core we, we first came up with the idea of um, doing something for specific um, overlooked or ignored or well uh, it's hard to ignore Amadeo he's Catalan um, but Amadeo had the idea of doing Catalonia which isn't a country and so we can't get a country code and so we have to go out and buy it. Uh, a TLD from my account. And so this model of providing local, a namespace that has some local utility um, is one that, that we began with in 2004. And really what we're talking about when we're speaking about city TLDs or geographic TLDs or linguistic and cultural TLDs, these are all applications to the DNS to advance some specific interest. Um, it's really a public interest, um, keeping the Catalan language alive, um, advance in the interests of a particular city as a organized, you know, as, as, as a political entity. And I don't mean really the, um, you know, the one Tuesday in every four years kind of politics. I mean, having your garbage picked up, um, being able to put name curb cuts because people in wheelchair actually see the city quite differently from people who don't have mobility issues. Um, this is the kind of thing that we see city name spaces as being, as vehicles for organizing, representing the, uh, the relationships of people and objects uh, within the city. So historically, cities have kind of struggled with maps. Uh, metro maps have been kind of interesting. Both London and New York have rich histories of struggling with what does the city look like in terms of um, these metropolitan railway users uh, to the UK and, and Whatever it's called in New York. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so that's where we start from. Where we think we're going to get is drawing on our experience with Catalonia, which has a population of about a million. So it's quite a bit smaller than New York. Um, and a, starting with a marketing budget of 2,000 uh, euros, <clears throat> um, which was basically all that was. Uh, available. 
uh, we're moving forward at about a thousand domains uh, per month, or up to over forty thousand now after four years of operation. The same ratio in, in Europe is going to be the several million registrations over the course of the first few years. So speaking to the issue of um, revenue, we think that this will generate several millions in revenue in the first year and every year after. Uh, independent of the revenue bubble that's created at the beginning as we deal with intellectual property interests and the uh, business license interests. Um, so uh, it's not a money losing activity. Um, a reasonable question then becomes well, what do you do with uh, the revenue after you've got it? Of course, some of it has to be spent on housekeeping, there's staffing costs to be paid, and machines to be paid, and air conditioning and electricity to be paid. But there's also advancing the idea of what the model of the city is um, in the internet. Um, and we see some, a lot of good work, um, but it's not yet tied to any TLDs as applications um, by ur urban planners at the uh, University of College London. There are other places where we work is done for representation of space and relationships. And so we think that that's where some of the money should go back into is basically. This is open ended research. No one actually knows yet what a city looks like in cyberspace. <clears throat> um, again, I'll pause for questions. Um, I, I was still just on the. the the difference between, you know, before, the difference between the standard and the community applications. You said there wasn't a lot of difference, but could, could you elucidate on what the differences were? Well, with the open or standard model, um, during the Sunrise uh, auction, Sunrise and, and land rush periods and general availability periods, there'd be no restriction on who the registrants might be. So. We might have people from across the river, you know, from Jersey, um, doing registrations. And that wouldn't be a bad thing if you thought that NYC was the metropolitan area or the price of each region. But if you think it's the high boroughs, then that probably would not be what you want, uh, from the long registrants from our different locations. So the, community, so the community thing was just made, the uh, registrants would need to prove a nexus with the city. Would that be it? Yeah, I can't hear you very well. You're breaking so, up slide, but yes, there's a geographic nexus. That's one possible test for what is a member of the or you know, for the status of becoming a registrant um, in the dotted NYC main space. Um, there are businesses which have physical presences in the city of New York, but their headquarters are elsewhere. Um, you might want to decide whether or not those meet the test because they have. A bricks and mortar presence in the city of New York for registering in New York and their headquarters is relevant. Uh, similarly, there are people who visit New York, or who come to New York and leave New York. Um, yeah. <clears throat> it is up to the city, or up to, since the city is presumably the author of a letter of at least um, uh, non opposition, but we hope a um, fully engaged public policy partner, I think that's what we think we should do, um, to determine what the requirement is that we will represent an ICANN as being the community, and then make sure that it passes the test that ICANN has for community applications, which is called the comparative evaluation. Now, I should digress here and explain that. The beauty so. contest, we call that the beauty contest. <laughs> well, it's not quite. It's going to wear a shirt. Can you see it? Leeds. Yes. It, it's, yes. Stacey Leeds is um, one of the justices of the Cherokee, um, when it's now called the Supreme Court of the Cherokee Nation. And she ran for, for uh, principal chief in the last election. And I ran the back end of her, her uh, election campaign. Um, there's a car company which uses the word Cherokee as a uh, trademark. And so, really, the reason. I have a whole notion of a community application in this goes back to that very issue of who gets to use the word charity. Uh, do the charity Indians get to use it, or do the inheritors of the Jeep trademark uh, or that collection of trademarks uh, get to use the word charity? Who, who, is the, who gets to own that charity on the top level? So, the purpose of a community application um, is to create the possibility that we 
not get into a bidding war uh, because ICANN selected bidding or auction as the most efficient means of allocating uh, a string to two or more uh, parties that sought that string, presumably, that they could not agree on how to divide it up or how to share it. <clears throat> so if auction was the only mechanism available, then the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma would be in a bidding war with a fairly large and well-capitalized automobile company that periodically would have its own business as we That didn't seem like it was the right answer. And so the community if comparative evaluation allows us to determine if a community it meets enough beauty ranking points to be called yes, it's a community. And if it, it meets that test, then it has it is dispositive, that is, the Cherokee goes to the Cherokee Indians rather than to the car company. And this has been a long, hard struggle over the past two years to get the exact test and the, the value of passing the test into the uh, draft applicant guidebook. And uh, I think we finished that at the uh, second round of the draft applicant guide, uh, getting that a little right. So whatever we come up with is, uh, as a definition for a member of the community of uh, NYC, um, it's going to have to be sufficiently good to allow us to pass that comparative evaluation um, or the string, if it's in a contention set with other strings, such as under NYK or NYC, um, would then go to auction. Uh, but you're, talk you're talking about the ICANN process to get the top level domain, right? Right here. I'm talking about the value of, of the purpose of submitting a community-based application. Yeah. The, the purpose. Oh, I see. The, I, I, I'm, I'm with you now. So, and this I hadn't understood before, which is that we're talking about what kind of application is going to be made to ICANN, either a standard one or a community-based, because there are different aspects within that application to ICANN. That's correct. John. Yeah, I hadn't. I hadn't totally understood that. Um, so, so, so the city hasn't. So the city's considering both things. What I was wondering more was, you know, what I thought was kind of getting at is, given that, um, that, that, say we have a community kind of, uh, the community application is the one we're, we're talking about. How would we then, at the second level domains, decide who would would be would get a domain? You know, say like, you know a commercial applicant or a community applicant, you know, that same comparative evaluation, what would be the process of comparative evaluation of applicants for second level domains? Well, this is where you want to be uh, aware, that, um, aware of cost. That is, anytime you look at anything, anytime you pick up a piece of paper, um, there is a cost element. And you hope to be handling hundreds of thousands of applications for a domain uh, each year, um, perhaps even a million in the first year. Let me. There is a great utility in spending that money initially, that is, in actually handling paper and actually looking at things. When we did CAT, we required that every applicant show that they were using the Catalan language, because the purpose of CAT was to support the linguistic and cultural communities of the Catalan people, which are in northeastern Spain, and also in France, and in Andorra, and also uh, in Italy. <clears throat> so it's a non-nation state which contains populations um, in four or more nation states. The purpose of causing, or the consequence, excuse me, the unintended consequence of this requirement was that we had absolutely no bad registrations. Not only were all registrations perfect in terms of they were registrations by people who cared about the Catalan language, they were Catalan speaking or Catalan using, or they would borrow some Catalan in order to, uh, to get their Catalan name, even if they were not Catalan speaking Catalonians. Um, it also got us perfect community data. We actually had no bad registrations. We also had no bad registrations in the sense of cyber squatting on, on intellectual property. Because in four years, we've had four possible um, domain resolution issues. One of them was a person who worked 
who bought a name for a, a, a car company. Uh, he was Mercedes Benz. And then he lost the dealership. So he had the dealership. He had the legal right to the name if he acquired it. And so then after losing the dealership for reasons utterly unrelated, um, then there was the issue of well, where, where does this domain name go to them? That was one of the four instances we had of possible domain uh, abuse of registrations in the course of four years. Excuse me, my son just said that we were in some um, Okay, so the Nexus policy, the, the money that was spent in from the eligibility of a potential registrant, pays off big in removing bad registrations. Um, we really like NYC to be clean. Uh, we have very little piece of registration. To get that, um, we have to do uh, pre-validation. That is, we have, actually have to look at some aspect of the application of the applicant to determine their eligibility. And determining your eligibility as a member of the community also means we've also eliminated the possibility that there be a bad rate to spring, uh, a cyber squatting, uh, um, in, infringing on the electoral property rights of others, and so on. So it's a good thing. Um, and we discovered that after doing two and a half years of pre-validation, we switched to post-validation, which means we accepted every registration, and then we would look at some of them to see if they were abusive. And we had already steered away all the bad actors. We have no bad actors still after almost a year and a half of post-validation. Um, so it really pays off in going with strong eligibility policy, because you end up with a main state that is Completely without police abuse, it's completely without intellectual property complaints, um, and it's completely without fishing and other bad actors. Basically, all these economic activities move to places where the return on investment is greater. If they have a lower cost of interest, that's good. If they have a higher payout, that's good. Okay. Uh, do, you, do you want to take a break, Eric, to deal with your. Yeah, if you don't mind. Or, yeah, if you kill your mic. Okay. Okay. You know, we were going to show videos, Eric, and then, you know, and then take the break at three. We could take the break now and show the videos after. Um, okay, so what time should I come back on the call? Um, so, so we take, we'll take 15 minutes now. So it's 2.30 now, so let's say 2.45. Okay. So 15 minutes break.